morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you're coming to us from. This is another episode of The Nonprofit Show. And we have on a really cool guest because he looks so fabulous and dapper, number one. But um, Anthony A. Dix Jr. is going to be talking to us today about developing courageous leaders. You know, we talk a lot about leadership on The Nonprofit Show. We talk about it throughout our sector. But a courageous leader, wow. This is a special time to really be thinking about this. So, Anthony, um, we are delighted you are here. In case we haven't met before, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jared R. Ransom, the nonprofit nerd and CEO of the Raven Group, is off this week. Again, we have these amazing, amazing, I, Anthony, I want to call them courageous sponsors because, you know, they don't dictate what we talk about. Hmm. They have no editorial control, okay. um, nor, I mean, they we ask for input, of course, but I mean, so they're courageous leaders in, in turning over um, their names and their logos and their branding to these conversations. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. And what's really cool about these folks is that most of them have been with us for more than 900 episodes. And you can find us on our streaming broadcast platforms, podcast platforms, and also, Anthony, I like to call it our sexy new app. Um, so you can download that QR code and then we'll connect with you every day when the sh new shows are managed. Okay, Anthony A. Dix, Jr., I love that you're here. I love that we're going to have this conversation. I have to admit, I've watched some of your videos on your website, oh, wow. and you're like super engaging, super empowering, and you make me believe that I can do this. And that's a skill. And so oh. let's back up and ask you to kind of share with us what 180 Management Group does and how you impact the nonprofit sector. Well, first and foremost, let me first say thank you so very much for the opportunity to share on a subject that I love. There's Good. nothing more that I love. Well, maybe one more, maybe two more things that I love more than leadership. And that's leaders and my wife. So thank you so very much for having me uh, on this, this afternoon or whatever time uh, you are in the yeah. viewing audience to yeah. share about courageous leadership. I am Anthony Adix Jr. and I'm the senior leadership consultant at 180 Management Group, which is a boutique management consulting firm that transforms nonprofits uh, and their operational culture. And we do that through three areas, people, processes, and planning. And so we really love to come alongside nonprofit organizations so that we can help them overcome their unique challenges and get back to doing what they love. And that is transforming the world. And again, I'm just elated to be here today to have this opportunity to converse with you, Julia. Thank you for having me. No, this is really cool. Now we, I have to fess up. You know, we had, I don't want to call her your better half, but we had the <laughs> lovely Miriam. She's better. Definitely better. <laughs> Definitely better. We, we had Miriam on months ago and she was transfixing. We were just like, wow, she yeah. was so riveting. And again, um, gave us some ideas and, and perspectives that we don't often hear because mm. so often, as you know, Anthony, we're so like, you know, nose to the grindstone, dealing mm -hmm. on our mission, and we just mm -hmm. don't look up and we don't take a deep breath and kind of think about what we're actually doing and how right. maybe more how we're doing it. So yeah. let's talk yeah. about this this word, which I find fascinating. You know, we we always say leaders achieve missions, but you snuck in this word courageous leaders. Yes. yes. What does that mean? Courageous leaders, and in my leadership framework, it's built on the idea of heroic leadership. Now, heroic leadership, as it's studied in academia, uh, has its challenges, and I nuance the, the term and concept a little bit differently, because in academia, they talk about heroic leadership being those leaders who wear a cape, and they save, and they make decisions unilaterally. For me, a heroic leader is someone who inspires people to aspire 
to do things and be things greater than themselves. And they do that via community. And there are certain characteristics of a heroic leader. Uh, in ancient storytelling, heroes usually possessed a virtue that the author of the story wanted the culture to emulate uh, yeah. and begin to reproduce within the body politic. Yeah. And in Greek mythology, many of those virtues, cardinal virtues, one was uh, temperance, which is self-control, prudence, which is wisdom, uh, uh, justice, and then ultimately courage. And they say that courage is the virtue upon which all other virtues hinge. So a courageous leader is, is necessary to achieve mission because the mission that our nonprofit organizations are engaged in create and have so much meaning. And anytime you're engaged in meaningful work, anytime you're trying to accomplish something that is going to bring meaningful transformation and change to a community, to a person, to an individual, mm -hmm. it's risky business. Yeah. And you can't get involved in risky business if you don't have courage. So yeah. Nonprofit leaders have to inherently be courageous because of the nature of the work they do. It takes a courageous leader to achieve mission. And so that's what I mean by that. And, and that courage is a virtue. It is a leadership superpower. Really, really it is. And in order to achieve mission, you got to have that leadership superpower so that you can really get the work done and continue to do it when it gets tumultuous and tough. Well, I, you know, this is, this is really profound that you would come on and say this right now, because I feel like we have had so much fear, mm. so much fear mm -hmm. um, for the last now starting very shortly four years. And if you think about the pandemic, the global health pandemic, pandemic, mm -hmm. civil unrest, economic uncertainty, poor discourse, you know, how, mm -hmm. how poor our civil behavior has been. Mm -hmm. um, fear, it, I have to say, and I hate saying, this, oh, I can't stand saying this. Fear has kind of ruled the day. Yes. Yes. In many you ways. Know, in many fear, ways it has. If people have, you know, you, you'll say, well, I don't want to get in trouble by mm -hmm. saying this. Or, you know, mm -hmm. the, a fearful approach to just how we govern ourselves Um and so this is a heavy, a heavy lift for a lot of folks. Yeah. Talk to yeah. us about this, this piece of a formulaic framework. I love that you gave us an overarching way to look at leadership and mm -hmm. virtue. I think mm -hmm. it's a really cool way to look at this. Can we turn this into a formula? Can we be consistent with this? Sure. Yeah. Without, without a doubt, you can Courage does often operate on a continuum, but again, it's necessary. In, in a day and age where the earth, the planet, and the people in it are experiencing a degree of connectedness that we haven't had before the World Wide Web. So because of the World Wide Web, we are digitally connect connected and the global market is a real thing. Like you, No one is doing business as locally as they were 30 years ago. Yeah. What happens because of that is our connectedness creates a context where disruption can affect people globally, even though the disruption started somewhere locally. And that's what we saw with the global pandemic. It started in a village, but it affected the entire planet. Yeah. And when those things occur, it creates a feeling of scarcity. There's not enough resources or not enough time or not enough people. There's not enough to go around. And in a context where there, where there is a lot of scarcity, you need courageous leaders. You got to meet scarcity, not with abundance. You meet scarcity with courage. And in order to gain that courage, you need a few things. One, you need curiosity. This is the formula. You need curiosity, mm -hmm. competence, mm -hmm. and confidence. Curiosity, competence, and confidence, and lastly, community. Wow. Okay. I've just like, I've just come to your church because <laughs> I love how you phrase this. Each one of those aspects mm -hmm. is different, but they mm -hmm. work in harmony mm -hmm. to a magical degree. 
They if you do. don't have one, you know, I can see what you're saying. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the web of, of pulling meals. Okay, say that again to me because that, that might be the coolest thing I've heard so far this year. If you want to develop courageous leaders, what courageous leaders need in order to develop in events and embody that courage, they need curiosity. You have to have a seeker, a, a researcher. You, there's got to be a desire to not just know what you know, mm -hmm. but to know what you don't know, to go out there and, and, and learn. Uh, and in many instances, we're operating at an operational rhythm where we feel like we don't have time enough to learn. We've got time enough to act, but not time enough to learn. But if you're going to be courageous instead of reckless or fearful, <laughs> yeah, you got to you got to have some courage. You got to have some curiosity to kind of really give you the research and information necessary to make sound decisions, make great strategies, motivate people and lead them into the future. You also got to be competent. Mm -hmm. You got to be competent. Not I, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting ready to say something that I don't like saying. I don't want to get in trouble here, but <laughs> we are living in a day and age where we are sacrificing leadership on the altar of charisma. So as long wow, as you're yeah. charismatic, you don't have to necessarily be competent. competent. Yep. That doesn't work in the nonprofit space. If you're going to be a leader, you need to be charismatic. That's fine. You can be charismatic, but you need to be competent. So you got to be trained. Mm -hmm. Then you got to have what is the, one of the things that's just slippery is, is, is a premium, but it's not a lot of it. It's not like, it's a lot like time and money. It's confidence. Yeah. Courageous leaders have to have confidence and they may not have the same amount of confidence all the time, mm -hmm. but if they spend enough time being curious in order to gain and bolster and enhance competence, mm -hmm. their curiosity plus their competence will help them to feel confident. Mm -hmm. yeah. Say, I, I, I know that we are operating in a space where we're moving into an unknown, but we know enough about the unknown, so to speak, and some of the variables within it to where I have the courage and the confidence to say, I think we can move. I think we can move forward. Yeah. Lastly, and this is one of the challenges, I think, particularly of a 21st century nonprofit leader is community. Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to coach some of the world's greatest, in my mind, some of the world's greatest nonprofit leaders, and many of them wrestle with loneliness. Yes, undoubtedly. They, uh, they wrestle with loneliness. Yes. And we talk about teams a lot in our organizations, mm -hmm. but for how we are socializing in this day and age, we may want to begin using the word community in regards to the people in which we work with. Mm -hmm. Because a courageous leader requires the support of the team to mm -hmm. take the risk so that they feel comfortable failing without dire consequences. Yeah. A courageous leader needs an atmosphere where they have the psychological safety to say, I, I, I'm sure I'm confident, yes, mm -hmm. but I am not 100% sure that it's going to work. And if it fails, I need to be able to fall back, not on my competence, mm -hmm. but I need to fall back on my community mm -hmm. so that I can navigate and learn from the failure without mm -hmm. feeling like a failure. So that. That community piece is critical, critical for courageous leaders, because even though they are facing challenges that no one else has a responsibility to plan strategically to navigate, they need a community of support so that they don't feel alienated while they're trying to achieve mission. You know, I haven't really heard anyone talk about that. Um, the way you just phrased it, it was beautifully spoken and, and beautifully laid out because I think a lot of times that we are so afraid, again, mm -hmm. coming back to that concept of fear, of mm -hmm. failure and saying, you know, to me, failure is only bad if you didn't learn something. Exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. You know, so you exactly. got it. But I can I love this concept of community. Um, I feel like this is maybe one of those underpinnings of why so many people are searching for mentors mm -hmm. I mean, and not just young people. I think that's, what's fascinating. It's not just young people, exactly. but it is, I, I think Anthony to, to maybe draw, you know, a line to that. It is that community and um, mm. 
fascinating concept. I'm going to really, I mean, you've given me a lot to think of, but <laughs> think about, but this is one of them uh, that I'm going to look around in my own uh, cohort, if you will, and, and really see if that's, it's if important. that's working. It's one of the things that you talk about is overcoming barriers to mm -hmm. courageous execution. And my question for you is get your pictures, your catcher's mitt, because this is a curveball. Okay. Is this internal or is this external? Is this like how we view ourselves? Are barriers like self-imposed? Yes. Or, oh, they are. Okay. Ver or versus like downward pressure from community, society, our sector. Yes, it is self-imposed. Okay, and, wow. and this requires the, the the heroic leader to see themselves and the world and, and with a particular paradigm and perspective. Okay. In in story theory, you have a hero, uh, and, and this is some some of the story theory from, of course, uh, Joseph Campbell or Chris Vogler or uh, Christopher Booker or even a Donald Miller. Uh, you got a hero. This is what Donald Miller says in his book, Hero on a Mission. Hero, a victim, a villain, and a guide. <laughs> and they go under different names depending upon yeah. what story theorist you're, you're reading. The hero's nemesis, the hero's nemesis is, is the villain and the obstacle they must overcome, mm -hmm. right? But those two things kind of necessitate a heroic act. Mm -hmm. They aren't barriers to heroic action. They are the reason why the hero needs to act. Right. Right. So your obstacle is not a barrier to your action. It's the reason why you need to act. Right. The barrier is what keeps you from acting. Yeah. And what keeps many courageous leaders or potentially courageous leaders and heroic leaders from acting is feeling like they're inadequate. Yep. yep. Feeling like they are imposters. Yep. I was just going to say imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. That's ex yeah. that's exactly, exactly. Which is the reason why you need the mechanisms of curiosity mm -hmm. and competence. Right. Have, you, you probably uh, noticed this in, in your time, like looking at movies and stuff like that. You may see a, maybe it's a scary movie and you're sitting in the theater looking at the television screen and you're saying to yourself, why are these people walking in there? Like you hear a noise. Why are you walking towards it? <laughs> Right. That's the heroic <laughs> curiosity necessary yeah. for courageous action. So the person who's curious yeah. enough to begin to investigate where that sound is coming from, mm -hmm. let's investigate why we haven't been able to increase our endowment or we haven't been able to get as much uh, from our donors as we have in the past. Let's investigate how it is we can move into this new space now that the legislation has changed or the mood of the body politic has changed in right. regards to how we were funded or how we were even going to give these services. Now, the government used to factor out these services to us as a nonprofit profit. And now they're saying they want to bring those things back into health and human service. So how do we navigate this? But the person who has that curiosity yeah. is the one that's got the seed of courageous leadership. And yeah. they need to give, uh, be given the opportunity and the competence necessary to act, because that's what helps to overcome the barrier of the feeling of inadequacy. I don't know enough. I don't have enough. Or the feeling like an imposter. I'm in the wrong place. Somebody else would be better at this. Mm -hmm. If you feel yourself saying that and you're watching this, I want to tell you, you're the best person for the job. You know, and so thank you for saying that to our viewers and to our listeners. I would love, this is always kind of one of my favorite lenses to look through um, because, you know, I'm a white woman of privilege over the mm -hmm. age of 60. I'm wondering, does this have like a gender lens? Like, do women suffer more from this than men? I mean, when, when I look out there, I think if you're a white male, it's, you know, you'll be like, yeah, I can do that. Where a white woman would be like, well, I need more education. Or I, even though those two people might be on the mm -hmm. same level on, on paper, on paper, just like everything lined up, same education, same region, same age, same mm -hmm. economic situation. But that gender piece is a little different. And do you see that? Or is that just something that we get caught up in? I think you identified something that is 
so necessary for, for us to kind of unpack and unfold because how you respond to inadequacy mm. has a lot to do with the heroes you've seen overcome it. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So if I don't have a lot of heroes who show the way of how they've dealt with their inadequacy, I'm inadequacy may affect me to a different degree. Not that one gender has it more than others. We all may wrestle with it, but our response to it can be hampered by who we've seen celebrated as courageous leaders. If we don't celebrate enough women in leadership, then young women in leadership may not respond appropriately when they feel those feelings of inadequacy. It's basically, if I've seen you do it, then I know it can be done. Wow. And when the aggregate, um, the aggregate leadership community only sees one type of leader overcoming, mm -hmm. it says to them subconsciously, well, then obviously somebody who looks like me, dresses like me, is my age, we don't have what it takes to overcome because all of the people who've overcome it look this way, they dress this way, they talk this way, they're in this particular age bracket, I don't have what it takes. And so I think you're on to something about how gender differences respond to feelings of inadequacy differently, which is a, one of the reasons why we need to be celebrating a more diverse group of uh, of heroic leaders. There's enough room in the sky for every star to shine. There's enough room on the stage for more than one hero. Yeah, I love that you said that. And we need to be cultivating that. I mean, mm -hmm. for, for more reasons than just this conversation, but you know, we have a, an aging population. We have a huge demographic of leadership that's retiring. Yeah. <laughs> It's like aging out of leadership, you know, mm. and we need, so, so I feel like this is the right time, the right and the ripe time to start having these conversations so that we can mm -hmm. bubble up these, these next gen leaders, um, yeah. as opposed to complaining about them, which I, I feel like a lot of people my age, you know, complain about the next gen leadership, which is dreadful. I mean, it's a dread. Right. That's, that's a topic for another day. Mm. Um, let me, you know, I could talk to you for, I'm telling you through the holidays because I'm wow. riveted by so much of what you've said, but I want you, if you can, to drill down to the number one benefit of having create courageous leadership. That's really, that's easy. You said it's like, there's too much to choose from. <laughs> that's easy. The number one benefit. <laughs> of courageous leadership is it's contagious not what i thought you would say it's okay. contagious it's contagious when you okay. see someone else being courageous and and they do it and do it well which they do it it brings something out of you it brings something up in me there's a, a wonderful poem uh by edgar a guest called somebody said that it couldn't be done uh, somebody said that it couldn't be done, but he would have truckled, replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. Okay. That that poem and the reading, the rehearsing of that story of somebody doing something that was never done before mm -hmm. is, is told in order to help somebody else do what they've never done before. Okay. And courageous leadership does that. It, it gives someone an opportunity to inspire someone to aspire to do something they've never done before. And when you execute with courage in an organization, it should be celebrated because you, you get what you celebrate. What you, what you promote is what you permit. You get what you celebrate. When you celebrate that type of courageous leadership, it incentivizes others to do the same. So the number one benefit of one courageous leader in an organization executing courageously is that it becomes a contagion within the entire organization and you can have an organization filled with courageous leaders. Wow. You know, that might be the, for me, that might be the biggest uh, lesson of this conversation. Um, I'm going to go back and watch this, this episode because I've, I've heard you say so many amazing things that I think sometimes we know or we feel, but maybe 
maybe we can't articulate it mm. or we mm. can't put it in, you know, you use that word framework. And I love that. I think that's really powerful. And, you know, I love what you said about, I'm going to think about this today, Anthony. Um, I love what you said about leadership can be contagious mm-hmm. because I think that a lot of leaders to your point, feel like they're by themselves. They're at the top of a pyramid and they don't think about that. They think about, mm-hmm. am I getting the job done? <laughs> yep. 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 Versus are we nurturing and cultivating more of this, this approach? Cause we work in fear. Yeah. And, and working in fear inoculates a lot of, a lot of your peripheral vision, right? <laughs> we talk about leadership and vision. Many of the times that vision creates tunnel vision when you need your peripheral vision to be 2020 as well, so that you can continue to bring others alongside of you. Because when you're leading by yourself, you're not leading, you're just taking a walk. And so <laughs> focusing, <laughs> focusing on opportunities to, again, create communities that have courageous leaders in them is important for us to navigate some of the nuances that the future promises to challenge us with. And, right. and we've got models. We just got to continue to provide them with the training to be competent, the space to be curious, mm-hmm. right? The affirmation to be confident mm-hmm. and the community to feel safe, Yeah, to feel safe. Yeah. If we can do those things, then the sky's the limit for what we can accomplish. Well, you have been a magical, magical guest. And I well, think thank that- you. Um, wow. I literally, I could just keep, keep this conversation going. Um, really, really a wonderful and uplifting way to look at this, um, issue of leadership and why we get discouraged. And I think Anthony, you know, this is a conversation to be had Mm -hmm. because we're burning out our leaders. We're Mm -hmm. frying them. Mm -hmm. They deal with such tough, tough things. And yeah. so how do you insulate yourself from the horror and the trauma that you might be engaged in and lead at the same time, find that compassion mm-hmm. um, and confidence and competence, like you said, to, to navigate out. Super important. This is amazing. Anthony A. Dix, Jr., Senior Leadership Consultant, 180 Management Group. Check out 180managementgroup.com. Their website's beautifully done, beautifully done. Thank um, you. Oh yeah, it's it's just lovely. Um, but it has some great information. You can actually watch um, content from some of the trainers to learn about how they work with their their clients and, and how they work with coaching and process. Um, it's it's riveting stuff. And I think um, in today's world, Anthony, we need to be stepping back and mm. saying how do we not just fight the fires, but we mm-hmm. do fire management prevention. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Like, right. how do we kind of say, okay, wait, I'm not just going to be responding to all the disasters. Mm-hmm. I've got to be more of a leader and, and be thoughtful about this. And, and I feel that's kind of like your, your vibe when you, yes. when you go through that um, site. So really cool. I su- so enjoyed this. Thank you. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm super inspired myself. And I think, Anthony, before I let you go, you know, this is the time of year where a lot of leaders, they're fatigued Mm -hmm. and they're frightened because they're not going to make their numbers or they're worried about Mm -hmm. next year. You know, demand goes up around the holidays, whatever things are going at you. Right. And so this was a perfect time to hear this message. So thank you for coming on to the nonprofit show. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jared R. Ransom, uh, CEO of the Raven Group, also known as the Nonprofit Nerd. I'm going to tell a little secret. She's on her honeymoon. Um, I don't know if we're supposed to say that, but she's on her honeymoon. She got married last year and and wasn't able to take time off. But so we're we're excited about that. Hey, um, everybody, again, we want to thank our sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. 
These are the folks that join us day in and day out so we can have magical guests on like we've had with Anthony uh, A. Dix Jr. on today. Okay, you have so charged me up today. I've got a meeting I got to jump onto, and I'm going to look at this meeting that I'm going into next with a new lens. Thank you. Amazing. Thank it's you been, for having me. It's been lovely. Hey, everybody, as we leave every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we like to end with this message. And goodness sakes, it means something different every time I say it, which is so weird, but I've been saying this line now for almost four years. And the message is to stay well, so you can do well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Anthony. Happy holidays to you, my friend.